Hi, Kristen. Hello. Oh, are we just going? Oh, you already got through. Oh, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Kristen Snowden. I'm a marriage and family therapist in the state of California, certified life coach. Um, but today, this is not supposed to take the place of therapy. It's just supposed to be a kind of psychoeducational lecture. The theme or the topics that I tend to talk about are how to improve relationship dynamics, how to better understand and have a better language for what might be going on in your relationships when you find that things just aren't working or there's a lot of unhappiness or tension or arguments. Now the extreme um, symptomology can be there's a presence of addiction going on, so sex addiction, drug addiction, um, and there's lots of complications that occur from that type of dynamic just down to we have really poor communication, I'm having a hard time figuring out what I want in life, uh, I want to improve my relationship dynamics, but I just really don't even know how to start or how to put words to what's going on. Um, so, and when I'm talking about relationships, people ask me all the time is, what if I'm not in a primary relationship? And when I use the word relationship, it can be for all, for, a father, daughter, a husband, wife, um, even coworker relationships, friendships, family relationships. So do keep that in mind. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the importance of reincorporating or cultivating creativity and play into your life. Um, now, I know this is probably going to be not a very uh, commonly viewed or frequently viewed subject because I think we all, especially as a culture, minimize the importance of using our creative outlets and figuring out how to kind of get ourselves, our mind, our body into a state of play. But I can tell you more and more research is showing that cultivating your creativity and a play environment um, is our two huge pieces to self-care, to connectivity, to working out kind of your issues around vulnerability and shame, which is, you know, subjects that I talk about all the time. And I will tell you that um, when most people who are chiming in who are listening to these subjects are in deep crisis, are in extreme crisis, in deep struggle with their relationships or just within themselves. And these topics may seem like a luxury, you know, like I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't have the mental, emotional bandwidth, but I promise you that cultivating these two facets of your life or three, let's just say, creativity, play, self-care are um, paramount to the journey towards figuring out who you are, um, what brings you joy and passion, uh, your boundaries, like I said, understanding and kind of rumbling with your shame voices and your vulnerability issues and help you figure out how you want to move forward uh, in the relationship or outside the relationship. Um, it's They're very important to healthy living, healthier relationship dynamics, um, and it, defining who you are, building shame resiliency, and then practicing joy in general. So one thing I really like to start when we talk about this discussion of creativity, play, et cetera, is to kind of go back to the origins. So think back to your family of origin. So when you were a child and think about these various facets, uh, how did your family have fun? Was there time and was there space for creative outlets, for fun? Uh, engage in, did they engage in what we call like self-care? Um, did you as a child have the time and the space and the encouragement to have fun, to use creative outlets, uh, to care for yourself? And when we're talking about that, that can be, when we hear creativity, I think we automatically think art of some kind, but it can be anything. It can be building things with Legos, music, playing instruments, listening to music, singing, um, acting, uh, taking something that wasn't there and making it there, imaginative play, playing with animals. Those all are types and forms, d designing things, reading, um, writing. All those things are various forms of creativity and play. 
uh, did you ever see your parents or your immediate loved ones around you uh, make fun or creativity a priority? Were there any shaming experiences around when you did an art project and, and maybe a teacher or somebody made fun of you about it? Or when you were engaging in playful creative activities and someone said, you know, there's no time for that. You need to get a job or you need to be productive or you need to do X, Y, and Z instead of that. Or even sometimes a friend of mine used this example that sometimes she'll be in a car and the kids will get really playful and engage and then it'll get really loud and kind of um, boisterous. And so she'll kind of shut it down because it'll be too loud, too chaotic. And um, she'll stop the, the play because it's just too much like stimulation going on around. So think about that. And then another thing to think about is uh, gender. Were there rules about what, because of your gender, what kind of creative outlets you could do? What kind of play you could do? Um, and were there restrictions? So if someone, uh, let's say if a girl really liked playing rough and tumble soccer or football or wrestling or something like that as her play or an outlet, would there be shaming voices around that? Or conversely, if a, a male enjoyed dancing or something like that, would there be shaming voices around that? Because you can't talk about cultivating creativity and play without also talking about these, these topics of shame voices, of the voices that are basically telling you, don't do that. That makes you unlovable, undesirable, uncool, um, whatever it is, but people aren't going to want to hang out with you and love you and engage with you if you do these types of behaviors or if you fail at these types of behaviors or you're not good enough at these types of behaviors. So let's first talk about creativity. We are um, creative beings. I mean, I think those of you who kind of know in a kind of anthropology, we're one of the only uh, type of species that like makes tools that designs things like that didn't exist before. I mean, just look around our entire modern society. We are we are creative beings. We take things that were not there and we make them. We create solutions. Um, unused creativity is not benign. This is kind of information that Brene Brown talks about. Unused creativity will live within us um, and kind of burn inside of us until it's maybe neglected or suffocated to death or will come out in the form of resentment and fear. So she's just basically trying to say, if you aren't finding some kind of creative outlet to um, share these creative, artistic, design parts of you, um, it's not benign. It doesn't just sit there in a, as a neutral energy inside of you. It kind of comes out in indirect, unhealthy ways. You know, it's kind of like if you have things to say and feelings and thoughts and they're not being processed, it's the same consequence. It's not just like, oh, I'm really angry, but I'm going to hold that inside and think nothing bad is going to come from it. Like bad things come from it. Um, so how, like if you've not been in an environment where you're, you've been encouraged to cultivate your creativity, or you've had a ton of shame voices that have basically said, oh, well, you're a really bad artist. You're a really bad singer. Don't, you know, don't take up that instrument. Don't learn that as their language. It's just a waste of time. Be productive. Uh, you, you need to, um, start exploring with intention through trial and error what works for you. So ask yourself, you know, do you believe that you're a creative person? Where, um, and when you answer that question, where did you come up with that answer? From what? From life experiences, from memories? Um, and then again, you need to really lock in when we go into this world of talking about creative, creativity and play, you are gonna run into a ton of shame voices, cultural influences, and messages around engaging in these topics. So be um, intentional. What kind of creativity would you be interested in, in engaging? Um, so again, it, 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 it's just as much a part, let's say you're in a relationship crisis right now. Um, you're not sure how the relationship's gonna be moving forward. Engaging or cultivating or figure out, figuring out these outlets of creativity and play, in my opinion, and what research is showing is just as important as going to these 
therapy appointments and sorting through your thoughts and feelings. It just really helps hone in who you are, where your heart is, where your passions are, and kind of what, what general makeup makes up you. And to not figure those things out or to kind of continue walking around this world with this like gaping hole in you. <clears throat> so um, again, creativity and play, uh, they find, well, let, let's talk about, I'm going to give you some kind of cues of ideas of what play and creativity can do and, and what it can inhibit as well. So um, basically they find that kids, when they're young, they don't, they kind of happily show their art. They think it's great, but then slowly we grow up and we gain a fear of other opinions of others. So it really inhibits our um, opinions, our, our environment and our willingness to kind of go outside the box. So we lose our freedom. Those who are more creative and, and more willing to engage in play often come from safer environments. So we're raised in an environment where they felt safe. And then there's this security from that um, safety where they're willing to take risks. They're willing to fail in order to kind of try this. So again, that talks a lot about the family of origin stuff. It, so that's helpful to kind of go back there. Now let's switch over to cultivating play and rest. So letting go of exhaustion as a status symbol and productivity as a sign of self-worth and value. Again, those are kind of Brene Brown's words. And if you want to know more about these subjects, she talks about them in um, like the power of vulnerability, the gifts of imperfection, where she really dives into these topics. But again, most of you who are chiming into these YouTubes or these videos are in a state of crisis and pain and hurt. Um, so the, my suggestion for you to start figuring out where your creative outlets should be and how you need to engage in play um, might seem like luxuries that you just don't have the time and space and willingness and, and the heart for right now. But Dr. Stuart Brown, who is a pretty famous researcher on play, I think he even is like the founder of the Insti National Institute of Play or something like that is his website. He has this saying, which is, um, I'll always remember it because it's, it's pretty significant. And all his research of understanding how play, the role playing has in the human brain, how we organize our thoughts, um, how we engage with others and this world through the act of play, the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. Oh. Because basically he's found the little background to um, his research. Um, and there's other people who research it, but th this is someone that um, Brene Brown uh, uses, is his job was to go in like, I think in the 1980s, early 90s, um, and kind of interview tons of people who have, um, healthy backgrounds, and then hyper violent, um, unhappy backgrounds. So specifically like um, something Whitman, who was the mass, sh the mass shooter at, um, at one of the universities, I can't remember, Not, I don't know if it was Kent State or something like that. But basically they kind of wanted to understand why these people who have a lot of, um, let me see, how do I better explain that? His original research was trying to figure out why these people who do these mass violent behaviors, if they had any kind of commonalities in, in their child history. And one of the most obvious things that surfaced from his research, from looking over thousands and thousands of cases, um, is that they had childhoods with restrictive play environments. So. Um, what does that mean? Is uh, basically, <clears throat> I'm looking through my notes. Let me, um, he basically found, <coughs> excuse me, he basically found through his research that you, that play when you're engaging in those types of behaviors, it helps build empathy. It helps provide tools for flexibility and then therefore handling stress. It helps improve or help someone get to a lightheartedness level, adaptability, and produces a sense of community and belonging. 
Um, and then those with restrictive play histories have increased violence, depression, inflexibility. So um, one of the most common things that's really interesting is when people are in recovery from addiction, uh, you know, they'll, they'll often say that their addiction kind of, you know, they're, if they're using drugs or sexually acting out, that period is very tiny compared to the rest of the day or weeks or months, which are often consumed with fantasizing about it. Oh, should I do that? Then I'll get away with it. Okay, if I do it this way, then, then they won't catch me here or I'll say this lie. So a large amount of their time and energy is consumed with kind of getting into this flow of their addiction, of how to do it, how to lie about it, how to engage, how to get away with it. And so they say one of the most important recovery steps um, that one in, in recovery should take is figuring out how to engage in creativity and play to kind of replace that all-consuming process of their addiction. And they actually are saying, like neurologically, they're finding that um, if you ever watch uh, animals, like all those YouTube videos of animals playing, or even kids, you kind of see that they're in this altered state. So even though they might be kind of um, engaging in what looks like, like a violent behavior, jumping up on each other, horse, um, horse playing, rough housing, they are in this altered um, conscious state. And there's definitely something, you know, and there, the research continues about what that altered state does to the human brain and human development. So there's, um, I'm almost done, but these are my last um, statements is there's seven properties of play. So when you're trying to figure out, okay, so Kristen's saying that this whole play thing is really important. I don't do any of it. Everything that I do is for a very specific purpose and intention. So what's this whole play thing and how do you start doing it? Dr. Stuart Brown talks about seven properties of play, which is that first and foremost, there appears to be no apparent purpose to it. So um, I'm gonna use the example of singing in my car. Uh, I could handle a two hour road trip without even skipping a beat as long as I have music that I can be like singing to. So there's no purpose to it. I don't get any kind of gold medal or trophy for it. It's just something that allows me to pass the time that I enjoy and it's fun to do. Second, it's voluntary. So it's not something that someone drags me or forces me to do. In fact, probably my husband wishes that I didn't do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah. second is that it's voluntary. I can't have this feeling that I have to do it. Someone's making me do it. It's, I'm doing it out of my own free will and choice. Three is that there's an inherent attraction to it. So I, I like it. I want to do it. it. I'm intrigued by it. It's something that is, you know, fits into my passions and my interests. Four, there's a freedom from time. So I don't have the restrictions of, okay, I can do this for this long and this way. And I'm, I'm already out of the box about the time and the general measurements of time um, when I'm in the state of play. Five, which is the most intriguing of all of the properties, in my opinion, is that when you're truly engaged in play and something you're really enjoying and kind of fit all the previous four requirements, right? A purposelessness to it, voluntary, I'm, att I, I'm attracted and I want to do it. It's fun to do. I'm free of time. Your consciousness kind of goes into a different state. He calls it diminished consciousness of self. Other people will call it like, I get in the zone. Um, so sometimes people will talk about that, like your basal ganglia, like when you're kind of doing something that you really enjoy and you're in that zone, your brain kind of shifts into like another state of consciousness. That's what he's kind of talking about. That it, it's, a, it's a telltale sign that you're in a state of play when you've noticed that you could shift into that state of altered consciousness, so to speak. And then there's uh, two other things, which is an improvisational co component, that's his sciency words, but really what that's just saying is because I'm outside the realm of time measurements and I have this altered state 
and I'm, it, it's voluntary and I love it, but there's no purpose to it. It allows you this, this open space to have flexibility and flow and a willingness to change, right? So I have a three-year-old who's in preschool and he goes into the play area and there's, there's no rules. There's just a house with a kitchen and a couple kids and toys out there. And it's like, you watch them and they just start going and, okay, I'm the daddy, you're the mommy. And then we have the doggies and now there's cars driving and there's sound effects. And then now we're going to play chase. And there's just this flow of going, you know, without rules being exchanged where there's this improvisational component. And that my friends, by the way, is what they're saying is so important is that if you're engaged in these creativity play outlets where there's this openness to flow and bend that when you're faced with these stressful struggles that life puts in front of you, that you will kind of almost have a dress rehearsal for, okay, all right, I know that I can ebb and flow and get around this disaster because I know I'm resourceful. I know I can engage in these behaviors. I know I can kind of rekindle and reconnect with some form of joy in my life because I have that creative and, and um, play outlet. And then seven, the seventh property is a desire to continue. So it's something that you want to keep doing. Um, so when you look back at a time when you were having a great time, experiencing joy and deep engagement, when time passed and you didn't realize it, what were you doing? Think about it. Um, what were the play patterns? Was there imaginative play? Were there friends and groups or were you doing it alone? Were, was there pet involvement? Any kind of toys or tools being involved? So even it could be like, um, rebuilding an engine or something like that, right? Like it, it can expand. Uh, these things help develop empathy, tools for handling stress. It opens up the realm of possibilities. Um, and then also if you're repairing a relationship or your family is in distress, figuring out what the family or the coupleship enjoys doing together in a state of play or creativity can be an incredibly healing and effective way of rebuilding trust, connection, um, and just healing in general. So that is really hard to figure out as a couple what you like doing, right? Um, and you have to kind of get down to what would make me feel like I'm not being dragged into this. I don't feel like I'm, I'm a martyr when I'm doing this. I'm not looking at the time clock going, okay, I can do this for 30 minutes before I want to like run away. Getting into that with a partner is, is, really important and then even more so with a family um what gets you what what is something that you guys all enjoy doing um the, oftentimes too involving animals can be really great as well um i have a client who during her recovery she took up a uh, horse riding and and it really suited her it it calms her it gives her something to look forward to every week. She, she rides every Friday and she challenges herself. She does jump work with it and she just really loves the environment and everything. So that would be a state of play and probably even diving into the creativity part when you're doing the jumping and the other work with the horse. So um, that's about it. And hopefully I gave you a good foundation to start exploring these subjects that I don't think culturally we ever encourage. We don't send these messages saying that even once you become an adult and you start have, having to have a job and pay taxes, that creativity and play is still just as important as when you're a three-year-old running around um, preschool ground. So I really hope that you take the time and energy to figure out how you can incorporate those two very important things into your life. And that's it. Great presentation, and you're right. This is not something that I think we talk about, but also I'm not sure that's really valued it, you know, culturally. So, though it isn't going to be brought up as uh, as much, I thought it was fascinating when you said, um, you know, that the opposite of play isn't work but depression. And I thought, wow, I mean, that's really telling. And and I think about how many people, you know, are struggling with forms of depression. Um, uh, you know, in our in our cu culture, we're in the U.S., so most of the people probably are joining us from the U.S., but not 100%. So, um, you know, I think it's really important. I remember when I was in treatment, and um, uh, I was young at that time, and I was leaving, and the therapist said to me, if you don't make recovery fun, you're not going to make it. Right. And, and I remember this, you know, I'm coming right. 
yeah, next week is my sobriety birthday. And, you know, I've been around multiple decades and it's, you know, I still remember when I was in treatment, her saying that and, and I took it to heart and I'm grateful that I did. And it was a huge part of my recovery process is I did, I had, you know, I had things I was doing, you know, including with other people in recovery. You know, we, we did things together. We went roller skating. I was young. Um, we went cross country skiing. I was in Michigan. Um, you know, so it was like, you know, like, but, but, you know, we played cards. We went, you know, we did stuff, you know. Um, but I was thinking, you know, that I think for me, play, there are elements of play that I do more solitary. And then there, but you know, I like the social engagement of, you know, play too, which was hugely beneficial for me, you know, from a recovery standpoint. It also made me think of back to when I was a child and I, you know, my sister and I would do dress up and we'd make up these stories and, you know, just this whole elaborate, you know, whatever about whatever we were playing, you know, and, and you know, how creative uh, that was. But as a family, um, we also did, my dad made up a game called bicycle tag before helmet. So this is another one. We were on our bicycles in parking lots, all you know, my mom, my dad, and my sister and I, and we're riding around playing tag, you know, with people, you know, like now it'd be like, no, that's dangerous. You know, you need to have, you know, helmets and everything, but it was fun. I still remember that it was really fun. And we did it as right. a family. And I remember laughing, we were all laughing and, you know, and just like, yeah, no, no purpose other than we're just running around, you know, but we're together. So, so I think it is really hugely, you know, um, hugely beneficial, you know, for, for, you know, for all of us, you know, I was thinking too, um, you know, it must be really difficult if, for somebody who's struggling with, um, you know, kind of the rigidity of perfectionism, oh, yeah. you know, so, so one of the things for productivity I, too. Yeah, yes. Yes. yes I've got to be productive a hundred percent of the time. And, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I wasn't calling you out. So, <laughs> But, but, you know, like I was thinking, you know, like it's hard to engage in, in a, something new if you aren't going to be able to do it perfectly. You know, right. um, I, I took my two of my grandkids to one of the paint a pot, you know, kind of things. Right. And it was, it was a blast. And, you know, and I was like, I have no clue how any of this is going to turn out. We all did our little art projects and it was fun. It was a fun time, you know, you know, and I, it, it was all ages, you know, but it was, it was a really fun thing to do. But I didn't have any expectation that I was going to create art, you know, it was just like, we're going to go have fun and we're going to paint, you know, right. whatever happens, you know, and we'll see after it gets fired what it really looks like, you know, and so I think the willingness to be, uh, to not, you know, to, to have it not have results attached to it, you know, like so that I could just try, you know, w was really helpful for me too, to, you know, I don't expect myself to be, you know, an artist. I don't, ex I, you know, like you're talking about singing, you know, you're probably not going to record an album that we're all going to buy and that's okay. But yeah, you Badly. know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not one of our, it's not one of our gifts. You know, I didn't get that either. I have always said if my higher power wanted me to, if, if it wasn't a joyful noise to him, then he can do something about it and, uh, <laughs> you know, and make it, make it better. But it's, so far that hasn't happened. So, um, so, um, uh, you know, but I, I think just the being willing to try and just, you know, just put yourself out there, you know, it can be terrifying, but wow, the benefits of it are, you know, are so, um, I didn't know there was a research on a, a national Re institute, national of play. institute of play. Yeah. I Cause like I said, I tried to find recent cause he did a ton of research on the mass shooters of a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. And obviously we know there's been a huge uptick in mass shootings mm -hmm. and I was trying to find, uh, more recent information on those people. Um, the people who committed those types of crime lately to see if they, um, also had restrictive play. Um, Cause what was really interesting is uh, that, and I'm forgetting it's Whitman is the mass shooter that they studied, but he was like valedictorian in the military, straight A student, but they found that he had very um, kind of like authoritarian parents that didn't ever give him the space outside of like the little box that he had to perform and do these things and execute. Everything had a purpose 
to it. So he was never given that kind of open flexibility to figure out what he liked and what he wanted. And he basically hit this breaking point as a consequence of that. And, and obviously we can all probably think of people that we grew up with, or we might ourselves struggle with that, where, you know, once they hit college or the pressures of college or the pressures of early adult life, they lost it. And what they're basically saying is that those early years of having that imaginative, out of the box, open-ended, flexibility, changing, contouring, play, prepares our brain for when, you know, we get thrown those curveballs, or we do fail, or we, you know, it, it gives us the, the creativity and play outlets are, are the, the easier ways of us practicing vulnerability, you know, like it's, it's, it's a really important way for us to kind of figure out how to rumble with those kind of dark voices in us constantly saying, you're not enough. You're not going to make it. No one wants you. No one likes you. Um, it's easier to deal with someone saying, oh, I don't really like that picture. And me having to rumble with the shame voices around, like someone saying they don't like my creative um, project versus like my husband coming in and being like, I don't really like you as a human. And then me needing to find a language of how to rumble with that. Well, and I thought it was interesting and so true to how, you know, kids will, you know, here's my art and it's great. And it's, you know, I mean, it's their art and, um, but, but you know how, and I see that and I don't know if it's my experiences and I don't know if there's any research on this, but particularly with girls, you know, it feels like they shut down faster on some, you know, on some things, um, uh, you become less willing to risk, you know, and I don't know, I don't know if that's true. It just, you know, that's just my experience. But, you know, like, I think that, you know, they start closing, I think kids do start closing off and, you know, being less willing to share and unless I think it's really good. And I think you're going to honestly, you know, if you're going to say that's really good, or I really like that, and then I'm going to share it. But if I'm hesitant, I'm going to, you know, hide, hide it. Um, and, you know, and, and there's so many messages out there about our worth and everything else and so you know so everything has to be set to this perfectionism so so i love the idea of having an outlet where it's safe to to be vulnerable there's a question in here is there a way to know if you are in the flow or versus dissociating right and i think that's a really great great question and so this is just my loose answer you might be able to find uh, more details like kind of neurological science like fMRIs to kind of uh, substantiate this, but I think the differences between being in the flow and really enjoying something versus just kind of numbing out and dissociating is is the flow leaves you feeling more connected in the process so more connected with yourself, more connected maybe with the person that you're engaging with versus dissociation is just like. I'm, it's like empty space time. Like, I don't even remember what really happened in that time and place because I was just getting out of my reality. So the two things that I kind of came up with an example to, to say what I'm trying to say is um, dissociating would probably be taking my kids to the park, um, going on my phone and kind of scrolling through, reading email and stuff like that, doing things that I have to do checking things off the box while they're sitting out there and playing. Um, like I'm disassociating from that process. <clears throat> I don't know where the time went. All of a sudden 45 minutes goes by versus let's say we all decide to go play tennis and we're all running around the court and we're all laughing at each other and talking and, you know, 45 minutes goes by, but we walk away with a sense of connection and belonging and, um, and, and, just feeling more in our bodies versus out of our bodies. Does that make sense? It, yeah, it does. And I think, you know, that, that resonated with me too. It's like, yeah, dissociating is, is the empty, you know, and yes, it took me out of the pain or whatever it is I'm mm -hmm. trying to escape. So it was effective in that moment. Right. Um, but the flow is like, I actually feel good. And I feel connected, you know, you know, like I, when I'm thinking about stuff where I would say I was in the flow, like it brings a smile to my face, you know, like, mm -hmm. like I'm thinking just the memory of it, you know, makes me feel good dissociating. I'm just like, you know, well, you know, at least I survived that, you know, 45 minutes, you know, or whatever, or check things off the box or whatever. But, um, 
yeah, I think I think that connection point is really, really key to it. So you know, I, I you know, I mean, part of being in recovery is learning to connect with ourselves, yeah, and and others. And I think even you know, with play if it, you know if it's helping me connect to myself, and um, you know, in a meaningful way, that's important too. So so you know. Just, just uh, we all dissociate a little bit, you know, from time to like, you know, I go, I just need a mental health, whatever, right. you know. So I so, walk on a treadmill and binge watch some kind of TV show, and I'm like, where did 45 minutes go? <laughs> but you're walking like, on check a treadmill, it off, you got that done <laughs> Uh, with the treadmill it's like you need to dissociate because it's so painful to have to do that you know versus so you know so like one of my things and I will call it play but you know I take my dog you know hiking yes he no, absolutely loves it. I love it we come back from that people you know see us and they go you know he looks like he's so happy I mean he he looks like he's happy while he's hiking and I was like he right. is we are you know so so right. it, it's a whole different you know different state of uh of doing that so yeah and I tried as part of this project I was kind of sitting down because I personally struggle with the shame voices of perfectionism productivity so the voices are you're not that good at it. Why bother? You know, I'm someone who loves to get the cash and prizes and trophies for things. I like that to have an end purpose to it. Um, so open-endedness doesn't really make sense to me, but I know all the research says it's, it's important. So I try to uh, remember that. So I sat down and I was like, okay, let's reassess. What are these things that kind of fit these seven properties? And um, I do like writing about subject matter. So if it's not about I'm trying to meet a deadline and but I'm really just it's a topic that I'm fascinated in and I really love finding like my language for how I, I like describing this particular subject matter and um, you know how I can think of a new way of looking at it and writing about it um, that like I get in the flow for that um, and when I think what excites me most is anytime I go to like a new city i love just walking around the streets and just being in that new environment or one of my favorite things to do is to get me to whatever highest point there is whether it's a mountain or a hill or a skyscraper and i just love high angle scenery like i'll hike up there i'll take a elevator up there but just get me up high because i'm at my best and i'm in my flow when i'm just sitting there looking at the world from up there down you know, so those are just a couple examples of things that I enjoy doing myself for sure. Pets and um, toys or tools definitely can help people when they're doing these um, type of creativity play outlets. But um, that those seven properties are really great to kind of take through um, and figure out what exactly fits in those. That is something that sounds really interesting to me. Brene Brown, she said, okay, when I figured out all this research that this was really important, and I was like, okay, maybe we need to do this as a family. Um, they all sat down and they just all started shooting out all the different things that they all personally were interested in to see if there was anything that overlapped. You know, the kids, of course, were like, I love playing board games and family board night. And Bernays Brown's like, Bleh. like, I, sure, I do that out of like duty and obligation, not because I like it. But they ultimately found uh, an overlapping theme was any kind of water play. So they all like loved the water. And so they started trying to do um, vacations or trips around water play. Because when they're all like at the river or doing water activities, they're all in that flow, but in that connected community building flow versus, um, gee, where did that week of my life go kind of thing. And I think that that is, and when there's different personalities and different interests, it is more challenging to find that overlap, but, but I, you know, but it's worth doing. And I think even if, um, I think for some of us, it's like, okay, I'm going to be willing to try that. That wouldn't normally be my thing, mm -hmm. but, but I've been surprised at things that I've ended up really liking and getting into if I was willing to give it a try, but my perception of it was like, Oh, really? You know, so, so yeah. even if it's like, okay, I'm just going to try, you know, and, uh, and see where it goes, you know, I, I think that the, there's merit in that. So, so there's a question here. Um, I'm very isolated. And this Friday, I have an event about codependency. I want to, 
I'm going to not scream, but you know, we, we really have um, moved away from codependent language. So I'll talk to you about prodependence. Um, so this is important to me and I would like to connect with other women, but I feel anxious about meeting and being around others for a whole day. I so understand it. And I appreciate you being willing to share that. And so, right. you, know, you know, but, but, but the connection is so important. It's why on this um, site, sex and relationship healing, we have, you know, connection for people who identify as addicts. We have connection for people who identify as partners. We have all those connection points because, you know, first of all, I think we're supposed to be connected as human beings. We're supposed yeah. to be connected with others. But I think it also helps remove that isolation and shame if we, you know, go, oh, like Chris was <clears throat> about this, and I go, oh, me too. Well, you know, right. so I'm not the only one. I'm not the you know, the unicorn, I'm like, like, oh, we have common interests, we have common struggles, we have, you know, th there are others that are, you know, are in this um, with us and, and um, with addiction, and for the loved ones of, of addicts as well, it is very isolating. And, and you know, mm -hmm. because, because mm -hmm. there's shame, even, even if you're a partner, you know, it, it feels, you know, it can feel shameful, you right. know, even though addiction is, you know, mental health, you know, issue, society can still put, put that on there. So I'm thrilled you're here. You know, um, I, I, I'm going to shut up so Kristen can answer too, but I'm, I'm glad you're coming to this event. Pro-dependence, um, moving beyond codependency, because Dr. Rob talks all about, this is about love. It isn't about, you know, anything you did. It isn't, you know, in, you know, you're an enabler or you're whatever. It's, you know, you love somebody and, you know, we want to support that and you, you know, in this. So, so I'll shut up. Yes. No, no part of you or your love or your connection with the person ever informs that person's choice to engage in addictive behaviors. You know, they're two very, very separate things. So definitely always worthwhile to be exploring your own patterns. And that's what a lot of my videos are is kind of okay, the only thing I can change is myself. So exploring um, my patterns, what works, what doesn't work, what brings me pain, what brings me joy, that, that stuff, kind of taking an empowered stance on, on the change process. But for sure, nothing, there's never anything wrong with loving people and wanting to be in connection. That's, that's who, what we're all wired to be doing. Um, but also when you're saying, uh, I feel anxious about meeting and being around others, uh, what I also hear is, is deep shame voices, right? So that vulnerability. Um, I have another video that I previously did in the archives. If you look up um, Kristen Snowden, I talk about vulnerability, trust, and shame or something like that. And it's just basically giving you shame resiliency tools of how to kind of despite the your history of being betrayed and people falling short and hurting you um which creates your fear of wanting to put yourself out there again um and meeting new people uh it it kind of helps give you some tools to to push through that discomfort because I, I, isolation will will kill us all and if it won't kill us it certainly creates a very unhappy depressing lifestyle and so um I, I always encourage people, the linchpin is to push through that discomfort and get yourself around a community because that is imperative um, to your healing. And one of the things that was the most helpful, because I've been in plenty of anxious uh, situations, one of the things that was the most helpful for me to put it out there. So like when, when I started right. to do my introductions, I, you know, for me, it would be, I'm really nervous about being here. I'm, I've yeah. experienced some, you know, anxiety about this. You know, I want to be here, but I'm nervous. Just, you know, if, if you can, and you know, I, like it may feel like a bold step, but you know, if you can put that out there, it takes um, the power out of that anxiety for me. It, like it, it, like it deflates it and never, you know, cause probably the other women are going to go me too. I wasn't sure what to expect or what, you know, mm -hmm. like there'll be some me too's, you know, I suspect, but, but even just um, being willing to, to lay that out there may feel terrifying in the moment, but mm -hmm. it may mm -hmm. really help um, uh, reduce that. But, but, uh, you know, I, I promise you, um, 
you know, if you're meeting other partners, you know, it, it, there's a lot of similarities. Okay, so the next one. Uh, thank you for validating the importance of play as this was my greatest way of finding some relief in my state of crisis. I thought I was escaping, but it was actually the only place that could help my brain feel organized. That's what the research says, so I'm validating yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I find, like, I've noticed, um, I, I like to do puzzles and- uh, Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I found is, the more stress that's going on in my life, the more likely I am going to feel to be compelled to do a puzzle. Like, like at the end of the day, if, if I'm, you know, if I'm kind of like neutral, I'm not going to feel like I've got to go to work on my puzzle. But if I've had a really stressful day or a lot of stuff going on, I feel almost compelled to be doing my puzzle, but it really helps sort things out. And I think it's the focus is like, I'm so focused on, you know, like what is the piece that goes there? You know, like it really, it reorganizes, like they're saying, it reorganizes my brain. It is. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, but I love it. So that, I think that is the title of his book, the Dr. Stuart Brown, is something about play and the organization of your brain. Like oh. they're just finding that it's absolutely imperative to the proper development. You know, just like feeling love and feeling safe and feeling secure informs the rest of your life, you know, kind of that attachment theory approach they're finding that play is just as important to help with that, that brain organization, that resiliency piece, that thinking outside the box, the resourcefulness is so important. So uh, this one is, I'm a sex addict in recovery for four months of sobriety, yay. It's been 10 months since discovery and I still struggle with expressing remorse and empathy. My wife will also say she does not feel the love or that she matters. I suggest doing some fun together, uh, some fun together to break up the gray clouds that seems to be ever present and leave the elephant in the room at home. Her response is how can we do something fun when we haven't reestablished a connection yet? I feel it would help us connect. What are your thoughts? Right, it's pretty new since the recovery and discovery. So there might be a need for her to do something fun that doesn't involve because remember engaging creativity and play there's a vulnerability there um, in that piece to it so kind of allowing yourself to have fun allowing yourself to let your guard down allowing time to go down but there may be a little too much hyper arousal in her with you um, like too many flashbacks too many watching what you're doing and saying for her to kind of let that time slip by which are the properties of play so initially, I think you're onto something. I think that can be a really great um, uh, recovery step for both of you eventually, but maybe initially she needs to kind of start doing something like that on her own or with another group of safe people. But I, I think there's nothing wrong with you suggesting that. Um, certainly maybe emphasizing that I don't think this is gonna heal. And I think when, if you and I start laughing together it doesn't take away the fact that I've, I've harmed you and, and I've caused a lot of pain, but maybe we can find some, some joy in between. I mean, um, I don't know. What are your thoughts, Tammy? Well, and, and yeah, and I agree. And I understand, you know, we, uh, we talk a lot about, you know, partners, you know, it can take, you know, a year or more of, you know, to rebuild that trust. Um, um, and I understand that, you know, she's, you know, she's saying how, how can we, do something fun when we haven't reestablished a connection yet. And, and, you know, hopefully at some point she goes, you know, that might be a, a, a step in reestablishing that connection um, in her time. Um, um, you know, and I think, so with John Taylor's webinar, uh, we, you know, we've had a couple of times where we've talked about, you know, even getting the vision. So, so it's like, okay, I understand that you're not there now. You know, mm -hmm. I'm thinking you could say this, or I understand that you're not there now, but you know, is this something that we can work towards and what would you see that as, right. you know, so you can kind of have the discussion about what that might look like. And it may be, you know, trying something that's completely new for both of you, you know, so that you're on equal footing with it as well. It's not like, you know, uh, well, you know, I've already, I've always done this and now I'm going to invite her to do this, you know, and she's, you know, so, 
so you're going to be better at it, you know, so to speak. Um, so, you know, I think where there's kind of equal vulnerability for, you know, engaging in some new something might be helpful, but, but, you know, like even just saying, okay, I understand you're not there that yet. I have a vision for this. Um, and I'd like to work towards this. Is this, you know, like, you know, what would you see and having the discussion about it and kind of holding it out there as something, um, uh, you know, and, and that it gets to be her timing on that. Um, um, but, you know, clearly, yeah, you know, each of you needs play. So if it isn't mm -hmm. together, then hopefully you're finding um, a healthy, you know, connection with that. So, so yes, good, good job with four months. It is still early. So, so, you know, it, it, from a recovery standpoint, yay. But, you know, from um, your loved one's standpoint, she's going only four months. Like I've lived what, you right. know, so, so there's both messages are true. So hopefully that's a little helpful. So. Yeah, so, and just some ideas too, um, just to add in is you can maybe start with even just some benign things like where there doesn't have to be too much interaction, like going to see a movie that you've both decided you like, right? And just the act of sitting next to each other and maybe even talking about or processing the movie afterward. Or I knew um, clients where they had a mutual appreciation for like the symphony orchestra. It's safe because it's like, I don't have to engage with you so I can still not feel safe with you, but there is something about sitting next to you while I'm experiencing this deep joy of listening to this beautiful music and stuff like that. So there are ways to kind of start benign and then move down to something more connected, so to speak. Yeah, I like that, you know, that idea a lot. We went to the... <clears throat> to a show um, through at the Arizona Science Museum, you know, and you know, so we were in the museum first and exploring that and then we went to this laser show thing. So, you know, but it was, it was really interesting, you know, and mm -hmm. interactive. So, um, so a continuation, because of my childhood trauma and a narcissistic spouse for 15 years, I'm afraid of all people in the whole world. That's why I stay alone to be safe and not be abused. Does this make sense? Yes, it makes so much sense and I'm so, so sorry. I'm so glad you're here. Right. And I mean, this is like a point of connection. So thank you for, for joining us here. And there are other safe places on this. Um, uh, and I know it's going to be really scary, but, but um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're doing the thing on Friday and um, I, I'm sure you'll have some anxiety between now and then, but I hope once you meet, you know, meet the other people that it's, starts uh, reducing the anxiety and you'll realize that you aren't alone um, and, and you don't have to stay alone. So thoughts, Kristen? Yeah, it just makes me think of, you know, for, for the addicts when we're sending them to 12 step meetings, at first we're just like, please just kind of humble yourself and walk in. And then usually the feedback though, nothing they said resonates with me. And then we encourage them to look for the commonalities, not the way that you're not the same. Um, and then the second tier, second step is to say, okay, go up and shake hands. Go up and get phone numbers. Um, when someone offers their phone number to you, take it, call them. Because it's just these little baby steps of replacing, you know, the, the chronic mental health depression, the isolation, the, um, the role, the addiction and acting out and keeping consumed by the thoughts of the addiction replacing all of that with a community, with putting yourself out there, with, with finding new sources of creativity and play and community. It, it's pretty, I mean, you ask anyone with long-term recovery and those are the pretty much the, the basics to how to have joy, um, long-term recovery, long-term mental health stability is community, um, play, self-care, creativity, you know, all, all the above. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm grateful you're here. Um, I can understand the fear. Um, uh, and it feels, I'm sure like you're jumping off a, a, you right. know, a ledge, but I'm telling you you're on a path and it's just the next step. So it's not this big cliff. It's, you know, it's just a step. So, and, and you can do it and uh, we're rooting for you. So. Other questions or comments? This is where the internet is awesome, right? Is for this subject matter, the creativity and play. Um, is 
they have that that website called like meetup and stuff like that where it's people with common interests so i love hiking or i love knitting or i love going to museums and you can just find a group of people pretty easily um tennis groups what, whatever your interest or your passion is that is where a um, the internet's a blessing versus a curse is it can provide that accessibility to these people who might have common interests for you to kind of engage with and do creative outlets or play with, um, or also find events that help with the creativity and outlets. So, so y y you're right. And but and I'm going to take it one step further. I didn't know what I liked to do when I right. when I first got into recovery. Like I didn't know, and so I had to really think about. Like I looked at stuff, and there wasn't the internet back then, but. Um, I really sound old, um, but it, it, there, was a, there was, you know, but I was like, what do, what do I even think I might like doing or what sounds right. interesting? And, you know, and I had to, I had to start there, you know, with things. And for any of us who are isolated or you're know, single focused on, you know, on, um, you know, on addiction or whatever, you know, it's like just going like, okay, I moved to Arizona. I didn't know I liked to hike and I was in recovery then, but I was like, I'm going to try this. I, it's like my thing who knew in Michigan, you know, if you hike, it's on a, it's on a flat path. Right. There's mountains here. I love it. You know? Um, but you know, I was willing to try it and I've, you know, I've shared that with, you know, other friends, but yeah, so, um, this year, um, at the end of the last year, I was like, I told my husband, I'm from Michigan. So we played Euchre. That's a card game. And it's a very... I know how to play that too. <laughs> we should play. So, my so, Kentuckian cousin showed me there how to play you know. Euchre. <laughs> but I was like, there's got to be, you know, I'm in Phoenix. Everybody's from somewhere else. See? So there's got to be, you know, <laughs> a chance to play Euchre. I got online. And sure enough, there's Euchre meetup. So, you know, oh we, my gosh. Yeah, we went and played, you know. So, so it was one of those things where, like, yes, you can can find things and I would encourage you even if you kind of go hmm that kind of sounds interesting I'm gonna go explore it you know I might love it I might hate it I might be kind of neutral on it doesn't matter you, at least you've tried you know and it's, it's one more opportunity and I think for me um, you know it, a lot of it was connecting with other people so I had the opportunity to connect with other people you know in different ways you know I've made friends that have shared interests but a variety of shared interests you know so that's been helpful right. too so there's a comment thank you for your feedback on the question um it, it's helpful to understand her state of mind too that's grateful so yeah yeah so so we appreciate all of you being here this uh recording if you want to reflect back or share it with people will be uploaded to the sex and relationship healing uh, com site and Kristen's site too she she posts them as well uh so Kristen, have a lovely thanksgiving with your family and uh, uh for those of you joining we'll be on next week eddie caparucci's um group is next week and Kristen will be back the, the second wednesday of december yes so yes yes, yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. I'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.